episode of Authors to Know and Their Books to Read. I'm your host, Mark Tanique Brown. And on the show, I have Tracy Jones, author of Five Years in the Fall, Overcoming Obstacles. So before we get started, um, make sure you guys check out the description box because in there I have all of Tracy's information as well as um, how you can purchase her book. You can learn more about her by visiting her website. Also, make sure that you guys follow her Facebook page so you can be notified when she releases um, new books as well. If you are a regular to my shows, you know I always say this. If we're not friends on Facebook, make sure that you send me a friend request so you can always be notified when I post new shows. Also, I'm trying to get hip to uh, Instagram. Make sure that you follow me on my Instagram. So Tracy, thank you so much for being on the show. Hi, Martinique. Thank you for having me. Appreciate uh, it. You are welcome. I'm glad that you're back. So a lot of you guys know Tracy from um, her organization, Beat the Streets. She was on Business Spotlight. So we'll talk a little bit about um, her nonprofit organization. But I know some of you guys are like, what? She write books too? I'm telling you, she be, she be on it. <laughs> <laughs> she be on it. Uh, swim so, the love. <laughs> swim the love all around. So such an interesting title, Five Years in a Fog, Overcoming Obstacles. Why did you decide to write this book? So I am featured in the book Broken into Brilliance, Volume 2. It's a compilation book with 11 other beautiful women. And I introduced my story of overcoming um, trauma and abuse. Mm -hmm. So in that book, my chapter is called From the Frying Pan into the Fire. And this book, Five Years in the Fog, Overcoming Obstacles, is the life that I went through after enduring the trauma and the um, abuse that I suffered that I introduced in that chapter. Oh, okay. Can you hear me? I can. Okay. So why did that spur you to write a solo book? So I've been wanting to share my story. Um, this is about a rape that happened when my son was six years old, he's 29 now, so over 20 years old. And mm -hmm. it took me a very long time to overcome the challenges, the trauma, you know, the PST from it. Um, so, you know, I'm finally at a place in life that, you know, I'm ready to share my story and help others. So I've been more or less talking about it individually as, you know, a topic came up or I felt that somebody was going through something. So I shared my story to share with them that they wasn't alone. But, you know, I'm at the point now where I'm like, you know what, there's so many people dealing with trauma, with physical abuse, emotional abuse, and mental abuse that I want to go ahead and share my story to the masses. Okay. So let me ask you this. I know that, um, and I'm kind of hearing an echo. Uh, I think it's from your computer. Can you turn your volume down a little bit for me? I sure can. Thank you. I think it's going down. How about now? Okay. We're going to try it out. Oh, perfect. Um, awesome. <laughs> so I know that that is such a personal topic. Why did you decide to share that um, part of your life with, with others that may know you now that did not know about your past? So when I decided to write the book, you know, I weighed out all of the pros and cons because I am in the corporate arena. So, you know, and I know it may, you know, be a sacrifice, but I'm ready for whatever path God has for me. Because what I find is that there's a lot of women going through this and they suffer in silence. I was one of them. So I know what it does. And what I also know is that talking about it actually releases that energy and allows you to heal. So as long as you stay suffering in silence, you know, you're, you're bound to whatever it is that you're going through, whether it's abuse or a trauma. Mm. So I know many people may not go as far as 
writing a book, how do you feel like it's therapeutic for an individual um, that did suffer from some type of trauma to just release that from them so that they can um, begin the healing process? So, you know, a lot of people that suffer, whether it's abuse or trauma, you know, you're embarrassed by what you've been through. You're ashamed by what you've been through. So you don't want to talk about it. You know, the book is going to let those that's doing that know that they're not alone, number one. But then also they could follow the method I use to overcome. You know, so I detail what I went through as well as talk about what I had to overcome in order to be where I'm at today, to be able to talk about it on a wide open platform, you know, even on your show, you know, that's live, that can reach millions of people worldwide, you know, mm -hmm. um, but people are suffering all over the, the world, all over the country. And, yeah. you know, I'm hoping that my story changes their perspective and get them in a place of peace. That's good. So now I know that you, um, and guys, the only way that we can reach millions of people is if you share this video now exactly <laughs> share, share 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 um so remember guys um when you're watching this show remember that you can always type in questions and i can ask those to tracy so tracy i know that you talked about how you overcame your obstacles can you let our viewers know how you did that so one thing that i had to um break the, the path of was that, you know, black people don't go to therapy, you know. Mm. I did have to go through therapy. I did go through a drug program because it led me down the path of drugs. I went through a drug program and in that program, you know, I had the therapy that I needed, not only just to talk about and get over the grief that, I mean, over the abuse that I had, but I also was suffering from grief that I had bottled up for so long that I didn't even realize that that was um, contributing to my addiction. You know, it was, it was keeping me um, unhealed, I should say. Um, so, you know, I learned a lot in that program about talking about what I was dealing with and what I was going through so that I could release it. Because as long as I had it bottled up, it was, it's like it kept me trapped. You know, it kept me trapped a shame. It kept me trapped in addiction. It kept me trapped in um, embarrassment, you know. And when I started talking about this, whether it was to one person or to a group, you know, it, it helped me release the shame. It helped me release the embarrassment because I'm at a point where I want the world to know that I'm a survivor. You know, that I can overcome and they can too. Mm, that's really good. And I know that a lot of times, especially in the corporate world or even just where we work, um, we're hearing so much now more about like sexual harassment. Mm -hmm. How how would you speak to that individual um, that is currently going through that now like how do you just because i know that you had to have boldness in order to tell your story how right. would you encourage somebody to have boldness to tell the appropriate individual if sexual harassment is happening to them so i mean you know one thing that um you have to come to grips with is there could be backlash you know, but what do you prefer more to mm -hmm. have the backlash or to keep dealing with this? Because one thing that we all know is if you don't fix something, if you don't speak about it, if you don't change it, it continues to happen. So mm -hmm. will you continue to be victimized or will you talk about it and tell somebody so that the issue will stop? A lot of times, even in corporations, they'll um, keep it confidential as far as who reported it or something like that, unless it actually goes to um, a legal stance, you know, but you definitely want to talk about it because a lot of times it become your word against somebody else's, but then not only that, you know, um, if it does come down to a legal stance, you know, you want to have some other people that can, can vouch for what you said, because one thing about it, and this, whether you're a child or in the workplace or anything else, you could tell when something has happened to someone because they change, mm -hmm. you know, change whether they were outgoing or something like that, because they do shut down. 
And that's exactly what I did and what I talked about in my book, that I shut out everybody that loved me and I dealt with this on my own. That's that suffering in silence I was just talking about. So mm -hmm. if they don't report it, if they don't tell somebody, even if it's another coworker, if they don't feel comfortable enough to go to HR or something like that, then at least tell somebody else because you never know, you may not be the only victim of that person. That's true. That's true. So I know we had a couple of people that just started tuning in. Um, again, can you tell people what they can learn from your um, your book? So the book, it, the title kind of says itself, but it makes more sense when you have read the chapter from Broken into Brilliance Volume 2. But it, it literally talks about you know, abuse and then, you know, going from one bad relationship to the next. That's from the frying pan to the fire. So this book really talked about with me holding in all of that um, hurt and anger and fear, it was, you know, it was very toxic in my life. So I detail in my book how toxic it became for me and that I actually hit rock bottom my rock bottom so my rock bottom is not the same as your rock bottom but for me it was my rock bottom and it was different from anything i had ever knew or anything i had grew up with so um you know the book really outlines what i went through it also talks about the changes i had to go through and really opening up and talking about it and what i did um, to overcome those obstacles and one of those things was actually um, starting with the streets, you know, I had already like with past the therapy and, and so forth, but starting the nonprofit has become therapeutic for me. It's my way to give back. And then looking at like what the, the young people are dealing with today, you know, my story fits right in. Even when um, I was talking to my publisher about publishing the book, you know, when she read it, she said, well, do you think we should make it rated R? And I was like, well, no because our teens are going through this right now today. You know, the abuse, the sh you know shame, embarrassment, suffering in silence, and they need to know they're not alone. And they also need to know how to overcome it. And that's when I book deeper. Definitely. So let me ask you this. How did you develop that support system to help you overcome the obstacles that you had? You know, to be honest, um, I can't say that I did it alone, but a lot of my suffering in silence was just that. It was in silence. I didn't have my support system involved in what I was doing because I was too ashamed. I was too embarrassed, you know, and it really became obvious as to what I was doing on my journey when I did go to recovery and had the support and they see, you know, all these activities I'm doing now you know, and they support me in this, but I didn't let them into that world of trauma and emotions that I was dealing with. I suffered in silence, literally. So, so I have can, my support system now. And repeat that last part again for me. I, I have my support system now, you know, now because I'm out of that, that space where it was embarrassing, where it was, you know, um, out of fear and everything else, I'm at peace with it all. So I, I have them in my life and they're supporting me in this journey of telling my story and so forth. So that's where my support system is coming as, as of now because I've let them in my journey. So why wouldn't someone look at you now and they like, man, she, you know, she's written a book and um, she founded a nonprofit organization. She did it on her own. She suffered in silence. Why do I need to tell people my story? Like, what would you say to that person that feels like it's okay to continue to handle it in silence the way that um, you did? I Why would not advise that at all. I would not advise that. To be honest, it's natural reaction and instinct to suffer mm -hmm. in silence because you don't want nobody to know that you were raped or that, you know, that you um, have been abused or, you know, that you're in fear, you're living in fear or, you know, because my family didn't know that I was being abused almost daily because I didn't let them know. Mm -hmm. So I would advise that because I could have got out of my situation a lot sooner if I had let them in my life. And I know that. You know, but because I kept it silent out of embarrassment, out of fear, out of shame, you know, because it's like, that's not where I come from. 
So, you know, I was raised way stronger than that and better than that. And it was my own um, perception of me that kept me in silence, you know, but a lot of it was just being embarrassed and so forth. But I would not advise that to nobody. Do not suffer in silence because you stay bound in that space. It's not until you talk about it and, and release it that you become free of the abuse, the fear, the embarrassment, the addiction, whatever it is that you're dealing with. Mm-hmm. So you have to talk about it. I don't want anybody to suffer in silence. That's also why I'm telling my story because there, I already know there's a lot of people just like me that are already suffering in silence. And I'm pleading and speaking out saying, don't do that. You know, talk about it, get the help you need. It's not cliche to talk to a therapist. You have Mm -hmm. to talk to somebody. So if you don't want to talk to your close friend, your family member or whatever, go talk to that stranger that don't know you, that won't judge you. Because that was my biggest thing. I didn't want to be judged. That's good. Yeah. And I actually, um, we actually have um, Monique McCoy that just started tuning in. She said, you are a strong woman. Um, <laughs> but I do have a question about that. Um, how do you handle, uh, how do you handle the comments from people, be it rumors or people giving their opinion like, do you have to fight every battle of something that you hear from another individual? To be honest, um, I can't say that I've had to deal with that. But growing up, you know, anything you did bad in the family, it spread, you know, mm-hmm. spread way more than what you do good. So I'm happy that this part of my life, my family is spreading what I'm doing good, not just talking about me when I was doing bad. But um you know, if I had to deal with it, you know, your truth is your truth. You know, that's mm-hmm. part of what I was talking about before being in the corporate world. I know that telling my story can backlash, but you know what? God has me on this journey and I'm prepared for whatever path he has me going. And if somebody look at my past from over 20 years ago and fault me for something now for me talking about it or, or releasing it, then that's their problem, not mine. Mm-hmm. So does, cause, cause what? Say that again. This is my journey. Yeah, definitely. And I just thank you for um, just sharing it and being just open and honest about it. Um, and I, I know that you said that um, you go more into detail um, in the book about it. Um, and that's really good that you mentioned um, Broken Into Brilliance volume two, because I know that on your website, you're offering that as a bundle, correct? Correct. Yes. Okay. You won't get the full effect without both books. You know, bundle kind of gives it all because even in the start of my solo book, the five years in the fog, I reference back to um, Broken Into Brilliance because number one, copyright, I can't reintroduce, but who would want to reread what I had already wrote in another book? So, you know, it's, it's really talking about the journey in detail that was presented in that chapter from the front end to the fire. So that's where the journey started. And then uh, five years in the fog, it continues that journey of what I went through. Okay. To who okay. I am today. So does the five represent anything? The five represents how long I stayed bound into fear, into shame, into embarrassment, into addiction, into just loss. I was literally lost for five years straight where, you know, my will to live had um, left, you know, Mm -hmm. and I talk about in detail the impact that it had on my child you know, and what he went through. You know, I got his permission to tell his story because my story is his story. You know, I was a single mom at that time. And, you know, he went through all of it, the traumas, and it's trauma after trauma after trauma. And, you know, so the five represents how long it took me to more or less get help, 
Okay. You know, to kind of snap out of it, let go of the fear. I mean, the fear still stayed, to be honest. I um, So I talk about the rape that I had in Broken Into Brilliance, and I go into detail in five years in the fall. And it literally took me 10 years to pass that exit off the freeway because I was still bound by fear. But, you know, the whole, there's different levels to, you know, um, overcoming obstacles. Because number one, you got to not be in denial anymore. You know, that's part of like the five stages of grief as well. You know, that denial, a lot of people stay stuck in silence because of denial or guilt or it's my fault. You know, I had to get past that, you know, and um, I was victimized. So I stayed a victim for five years. That's what that five Okay. Okay. And what would you say to somebody that is stuck in that guilt, blaming themselves for what happened? How do you reconcile with that? So one thing that I know in life is that you can't change what has been, Mm -hmm. you know, it's the past. And that's more or less how you have to leave it. But, you know, you learn from your lessons, you know, is there did you play a part in it? Because maybe you could have changed something, you know, maybe you were somewhere that you were by yourself and don't be by yourself. So you learn from that. It's not so much that um, that you act like it didn't happen. You know, the guilt kind of goes away the more that you get out of denial that it happened. Because number one, if you're stuck in denial, that's mm-hmm. in the age where it doesn't exist. Right. And then you go through the guilt of I should have did this or I should have done that. And you need to analyze that, really. Like, is there something that you could have did different so that it doesn't you don't go through it again? Because for me, I am at that point where I refuse to be a victim ever again. Mm -hmm. You know, so, you know, I have to get past the guilt. And my guilt was more toward my son and what I put him through, Of you know, because when I gave up on me, it affected him. Mm-hmm. So my guilt was more around what I put him through than what I put myself through. Because yeah. it was part of the process as far as I'm concerned. I understand. So what did you really learn about yourself in writing this book? So first I will say this. I was not prepared that I would relive this entire event writing this mm-hmm. book. But that's what makes the book raw and uncut. You know, it's this is my truth as I will never forget it. You know, um, it, I'm proud of what I've gone through today because I see everything now as a blessing. But back then I could not proud I was victimized. I'm proud that I'm not in the space of being a victim. Mm-hmm. I'm a survivor. So, you know, it's, you know, you have to go through it's really the same path of grieving, you know, those five steps to grieving. You have to literally go through that, including the anger. You know, I got anger or angry about the situation and I stopped being a victim. I went through all of that. I had to go through all of those stages in order to get through. Let me ask you this. Is the person that raped you, are they still alive? No. Um, what I actually found out, because, of course, you know, they did the rape kit. But back then, because um, this was 20 years ago, the way that the system is set up now, it wasn't set up that way. Mm-hmm. I actually had got a call from the Oakland Police Department because that's where it happened that like 10 years after it had happened. And I'm like, number one, using a last name that I had at the time as well as Oakland. I'm like, what is the police department contacting me for? Mm -hmm. They contacted me because the person that had raped me came back as a match to my rape kit 10 years later. So, you know, and he had been killed in jail. So they wanted to question me about whether or not I knew exactly, you know, like if I knew where he was, if I knew who he was, because at the time of all of this, you know, who we thought it was didn't match the description because my son saw who had raped me and who he described the person as and who he said the person was didn't match. So it was an unsolved crime for 10 years until that DNA match. And it came back that um, it matched because he got killed in jail. 
and he was in jail for something unrelated to you. Unrelated. They didn't even know because at that time they didn't DNA test you until you were leaving prison. Mm, okay. He was leaving, like you know what I'm saying. Like he had been in and out of the the prison system or whatever. And I guess he had went back. I don't know. Um, but they matched the DNA from the rape kit to his DNA from through his jail profile. So he oh, got okay. You know, he got murdered in jail. Oh wow. Okay. Okay. And, and the, the, I didn't have anything to do with it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That. How do you? But how do you get over the fact that or? How do you overcome that you would never hear I'm sorry from this individual? Because this individual, um, she shared this in her um, in her other when she was on um, when she was on the other show, uh, Business Spotlight, because this guy actually broke into your house, correct? Yeah, it was part of a home invasion. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think he was the actual one that started the home invasion but he came in during the home invasion and he knew the perpetrators so um he you know he i mean i knew him put it this way i okay. knew him but didn't know it was him put it that way. because like i said the description that was given to the police and his name it didn't match his description so the description was a light-skinned man with um, pimples all over his face well mm -hmm. The guy, his name was D. Um, he was dark skinned and he was young, so he had a baby face. You know what I'm saying? So, like the name D and the description didn't match. So, you know, and, and that was the description from a six year old child. You know, right. so, you know, they didn't really follow up. And like I said, DNA wasn't a part of policing 20 years ago. You know, mm -hmm. so now you know they're finding perpetrators a lot easier when there's DNA involved, because they make your DNA for a lot of stuff, not just from prison, you know, mm -hmm. you have all sorts of DNA records and, and things. So then it was just, it was just the way the system was at the time. Okay. So was there a point in time where you did have to um, try to forgive him or was that not a part of the healing process at all for you? It was not a part of the healing process. Um, I just had to heal me. Got gotcha. you. It had nothing to do with him anymore because I was the one still suffering. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? He did his deed and I put it in the Lord's hands because even at the time, you know, and I detail this in the book, you know, the man that I was messing with at the time, apparently the home invasion happened because of something he did. They were looking for him. But I'm sure, you know, I pray that, you know, it wasn't that he knew that that would happen. Right. Yeah. It was what he was doing and what he was involved in came back on him in our household. You know, mm -hmm. so you know, I even had to put it in God's hands for him, you know, to keep from wanting to kill him, to yeah. keep my family from killing him. You know, I had to literally say let it's in God's hands and I leave it there. So that's the same place I put my um, assailant or the person that assaulted me. Um, even though I didn't know who it was, I could not, I could not stay a victim, but I could also not stay victimized to who he was because it would have kept me in fear. Yeah, definitely. And I think there's one thing to um, touch on everybody that's watching just remember that your actions don't always affect only you but they can also affect um family members and friends you know because we have evil people out here and sometimes they'll go after individuals that you associate with as well so you know just keep that in mind be mindful of um the things you do and the things that you say um and you know, because everybody's not mentally stable. Um, Very so true. if you can tell us more about um the broken into brilliance volume two, because we know a little bit about your chapter, but what are some of the other people's chapters about? 
So Broken into Brilliance is um, a compilation, and this is really everybody that was in the book went through something that had broke them in their life, and it took them their path to get over it, to become brilliant, to be able to speak their story as well. So that that's the title, Broken into Brilliant. So there's different sections in the book. Um, you know, like my section was the broken to wholeness section, but there's a section broken to resilience. There's a section, I complete me. Uh, accountability is where healing begins. Mm-hmm. Uh, treasures hidden in the darkness. And, um, you know, when love was no longer enough. So every woman had a different story. So it wasn't all about abuse or anything like that. It's just whatever broke, whatever it was that broke them, whether it was abandonment, whether it was abuse, whether it was addiction, whether it was, you know, um, just lost in their life, you know, in their story, you know, they talked about it. And for all of us, this is a healing process. You know, Mm -hmm. telling your story actually heals you. So, you know, and it can heal someone else too, because I'm a firm believer in each one teach one. You know, and me telling my story can reach one person, but them sharing my story can reach the mass if my story alone doesn't reach the mass. So, you know, everybody's story in that book is to encourage not just women, but people that have gone through a similar situation or even something um, that mimics or resembles that because you know no two people's story are the same although you know now that i wrote my book you know there's so many people that talk about they have been abused you know and they're they are now wanting to share their story which is great because there's so many people in the world that have suffered you know what regardless of what it is you know i had to get over abandonment issues as well you know so that alone could break you you know, just feeling unwanted and giving up on life. You know, you just never know what your actions, how it affects someone else. So that's that's including writing a chapter in the book or writing a follow-up book, right? So let me ask you this. As an individual that has never experienced this, um, how could I be supportive of someone that has experienced trauma um, at this magnitude? What I would suggest, if you haven't experienced it yourself, and now that you're aware that there's tools out here like these books, there's women sharing their stories and, and men, because there was a, a man in one of uh, my publisher's earlier books, um, to let them know that there's resources out there like my book. Mm-hmm. You know, because, because you haven't been through it, you can never really know or understand what they're feeling or what they're going through, you know, mm-hmm. that's, you know, and that's why I speak from experience. I only speak from what I've been through. Now I may mention something I've heard somebody else go through, but that story is for them to tell. Right. Yeah. Um, so I can only tell my story the way I, I lived it. So I was just suggest to encourage them to seek help. Number one, to talk about it and, and get the resources because most of it is about shame, you know, and seeing somebody else's story lets them know that they're not alone. It kind of helps relieve that shame and mm-hmm. embarrassment. Definitely. So I know that sometimes in um, in people's households, I'm not going to even say a specific ethnicity, but in people's household, we keep that like, oh, that's our family secret. And we uh-huh. don't hold on in this house, stays in this house. Uh-huh. <laughs> How do you help um, individuals with that type of mentality overcome that and let them know somebody is being hurt in our family? And it could even be by a family member. How do you get through that? I haven't dealt with that personally, but I will say, because like my son, for example, he hasn't gone to therapy 
to address what he witnessed at six years old. So he, he's like a tip, ticking time bomb to me. And that's what I tell him all the time. And I still encourage him to go and get help. You know, you're never too old. You're never too young to seek help. And if you don't want to talk about it to someone you know, then an outside therapist is the best person because they don't have a prejudgment of you. All that they know is what you tell them. You know, so for those families that still holding on to the what goes on in this house, stays in this house, you're keeping them victimized. Because you're going to be the solution. You're part of the problem. Mm. You know, that's old, old school. But yeah. to be honest, back then, I mean, I'm sure there were some horrible things that happened even back then. But today, this is a whole different generation. And they're dealing with a lot of stuff that I think this that we haven't dealt with. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I think in the household, there was more of the uncles you had to watch out for and, you know, stuff like that. But this generation is more than the uncles. It could be the, the teachers, the pastors, you know, you never really heard of, you know, the preachers and stuff being part of the problem. You know, yeah. they, they used to be or should be part of the solution. But mm -hmm. nowadays, you know, the places where you would think there's an outlet is not necessarily an outlet. It's true. So, you know, I would suggest those that's holding on to that, don't tell nobody, keep it in this house mm -hmm. uh, to allow that person to get the help, to get it off of them, because it keeps them victimized. Definitely. And I like to also use this platform, you know, just to really um, urge people to take action. One of the biggest things that's hard for me to handle is um, kids being molested. And, you know, parents, uh, like Tracy was saying, you begin to see a change in an individual's attitude and personality when something like this is going on. Please maintain an open communication between you and your child. Um, don't make them feel like the victim if they was to share something like this um, right. to you. Please, 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 because that is just something that I, I truly hate um, to hear about. Um, and parents, please have that boldness um, to let the appropriate authorities know if this has happened to your child, if this is going on um, with your child. Get this boldness from Jesus Christ. Get it from whoever you need to get it from, um, because this should not be going on in your household and you willingly know and you're allowing it to go on because of fear so uh tracy i truly yes, do appreciate you for being on the show today how much does your book cost so broken in the brilliance costs 15. my solo book and i'm hold them up my solo book costs 10 but the bundle costs 20. So like I said, to get the full effect of five years in the fall, you have to do Broken Into Brilliance because I introduce everything in this book and then, mm -hmm. you know, go into detail in this one. So the bundle price is $20. That's good. And guys, what I did in the description box, I've listed all of Tracy's information. Um, you can actually purchase the books on her website. So make sure that you... Go ahead and check her website out. Also, make sure that you share this video um, with individuals who you really think that this story, her testimony um, could help as well. Again, Tracy, thank you so much for sharing your story and being transparent about what you've been through and also just writing a resource, writing a book that can continue to help others um, through traumatic experiences that they've been through through to help them have a better understanding that they are not alone um and you know let this be your outlet some way somehow so you can begin to um, become the person who god created you to be amen thank amen. you so much martinique this has been a, a true treasure to be on your show i greatly appreciate it and keep doing what you're doing because people do need to hear about this you know, um, and this is a way for them to find the information that they need and get That's out of the suffering and silence. So thank you very much for the work that you do.
You're welcome. You're welcome. So guys, make sure that you go ahead and continue to um, go to our Facebook pages. My Facebook page information is in the description box as well as Tracy's Facebook information. Um, make sure that you like both of our pages. Make sure that you like Tracy's page so you can continue to learn when she releases new books. You 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 are seeing her first here. Two books. Right. This time Good. next <laughs> this and if I may, uh, you if may, I may, I am having a champagne brunch book release on November 18th, this Sunday from one to three in Oakland, California. You can also get that information on my page. It is a free event. We will be fellowshipping, you know, having some fun, having some mimosas and some food and some raffles and a good time. So please and visit my page for that. What date and time, and did you give the location? Okay, so the date and time is this, uh, November 18th. It's a Sunday from 1 to 3. The location is at the Oak Stop at uh, 274 14th Street near Broadway in Oakland. Um, come on out. It will be in the Lionel meeting room. And you said that yeah. you actually have... Um, that information posted on your Facebook page, correct? I do. And I am asking people to RSVP because space is limited. Um, it is a free event. So the RSVP is to make sure that we have all of the, the good stuff and have enough food, enough champagne and all of that stuff. So come on out and help me celebrate the release of my book. Definitely. And if you guys would like to um, purchase a free ticket for me, uh, because I'm in Orlando and she's in California. So if you want to just get that ticket, I would be greatly <laughs> appreciative of it. <laughs> um, so I know, right? I get to meet Tracy in person. Um, so uh, guys, thank you again so much for tuning in to another episode of Authors to Know and Their Books to Read. If you guys are interested in uh, promoting your own book on the show, please make sure you just go ahead and send me a message in the inbox, or you can simply just make a comment down below in the comment section, and we can make that happen. So again, Tracy, I will see you later. See you all later who are watching the show right thank now. You, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. And until next time, guys, you guys stay blessed and be encouraged. Don't be discouraged. Um, today is a new day for you. Amen. Amen. So see you later, Tracy. Bye. Thank you.